Hello, and welcome to Flipping the Table. Our March 2023 podcast featured Dr. Jacob Katz from Caltrout, who eloquently described the Nigiri Project, through which rice farmers are building a system to recover California's greatest salmon run that depends on the Sacramento River Valley's waterways. Today, a year later, Michael talks with Tim Johnson, the founding CEO of the California Rice Commission, the nonprofit that guides the industry's evolution in marketing around the world. The crew at Flipping the Table believes the rice growers of California are pointing the way for all of agriculture to become among the most important solutions to numerous global challenges, particularly species recovery, water management, and conservation and rural economic development. Enjoy the show. A bit over a decade ago, today's guest, Tim Johnson, the CEO of the California Rice Commission, took me on a tour of California's rice country. It was a revelation, and I became a booster of rice growers for some good reasons you will learn about today. The northern section of California's Great Central Valley includes eight counties with rice paddies, four of which contain the vast majority of rice acres, those counties being Butte, Calusa, Glen, and Sutter. There are around 500,000 acres of rice in our state, And as you will hear today, the short grain sushi rice we grow is among the best in the world. The primary reason rice growers in the state inspire me is that they are constantly proactive in trying to meet the ecological goals of the state's people. As you will hear from Tim, who is the founding CEO of the organization, the industry's proactivity stretches back decades. Consequently, California has cleaner air, millions more migratory and native birds, and most recently, as you may remember from my March 2023 podcast with Dr. Jacob Katz, Riceland is providing the means to bring back the state's most important Salmonid runs. Of course, rice is not completely benign when it comes to the environmental impact. Conventional rice growers still use chemicals, Some can be toxic, but they have been continually reducing to work toxicity over uh, time through changes in chemistry and, and, and the time of use. They do use a lot of water, but unlike the common misunderstanding, they are actually borrowing most of the water because that which does not evaporate is flowing back into waterways that feed the Sacramento or in some places descending back into the aquifers via subsurface flows. It is important to remember that the Sacramento Valley was always a giant floodplain, soaked for much of the year due to runoff from the Southern Cascades, including Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen, and the Northern Sierras. Very few places on the planet are better situated to grow rice than the Sacramento Valley. Tim lives in the foothills of the Sierra, grows wine grapes, is a fly fisherman and a family man. He is also a very astute student of the political environment and state and federal policy. He works amidst the battles over water, species regulation, and greenhouse gas emissions. He listens, is not reactionary, but measured, thoughtful, and I would say wise as evidenced by the groundbreaking holistic research initiative his team has spawned with UC Davis. I believe he is an example of the type of agriculture industry leaders that the world needs because he seeks win-win solutions and is not prone to avoid answering questions, blaming others, or resisting the need to evolve as an industry. His crop, unlike some, has many advantages and thus rice growers' proactivity is easier to achieve than, say, for the lettuce growers in the state's Central Coast salad and fruit bowls where food safety laws require growers to exclude wild animal species. Nevertheless, it is his attitude, his way of interacting that is good for agriculture and more leaders like him aid the agriculture sector. Tim is one critical reason why rice in California is a good news story for agriculture year after year. I know you will be surprised and delighted to see how ecological principles have guided Rice's development and his staff's evolution over time. Let's begin. Tim Johnson, thank you very much for hosting me here today at Cal Rice to talk about your life and your work. 
<laughs> well, thanks, Michael. I always enjoy the conversations. I come uh, away smarter, which is always uh, important. <laughs> me and, too. Me too. I and I enjoy the it. fellowship. Great yeah, time. Yeah. We've had some good conversations over the years. So tell us how you came to this very important job you have today. Yeah, as always, when like, college students come through and say, I want to do what you're doing, tell me how you got there. And you feel a little embarrassed, but you tell the same story everybody else does. Well, I got here through a circuitous route. Really thought I would be in business. Um, got my undergraduate in business, got my MBA, thought I'd be selling stuff, managing a company. Never considered, even for a second, that I'd work for a nonprofit. Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up actually in Placerville, not too far from Sacramento. And that's actually what brought me back to the region and ultimately this job. My wife and I were in San Jose at the time, been there about a decade, going to school, had our first child, my son. And I'll tell you that four and a half hour drive from San Jose uh, back home to visit grandparents uh, with a one-year-old was not appealing. <laughs> there was no time of day you could do that where that worked. So we decided <laughs> to move back into the area, you know, not as many diverse jobs in the Sacramento Valley, Sacramento, as there are in the Bay Area, right, doing tech. Uh, so we decided I'll you know, be a little bit more flexible. And I took a job promoting rice for what was the rice promotion board at the time here in, in, in Sacramento, selling, you know, the idea of California grows great rice to people that would be importing it, Japanese, uh, South Korea, domestic users, right? We grow this great rice in California. You don't know probably much about it, but you know things about like sushi, right? You know, about Korean cuisine. And eventually the organization changed kind of away from the direct consumer promotion because, to be honest with you, agricultural organizations struggle to raise enough money to be able to compete with everybody else's advertising, right? Big restaurants, Frito-Lay, PepsiCo, all the beer companies, you, you just can't spend at that level. So we decided really to focus on what was impacting the growers every day, which were policy decisions that were being made, regulations, international trade at a policy level, farm policy, and really that need to communicate with people in Sacramento and all of Northern California that you know, we grow rice here. It's fantastic. You go to Tokyo and they say, oh, rice in California. You go to Starbucks over here and they say, what? Mm -hmm. we, we grow rice in California? Really try to close that gap. And so started working then on the policy side, on sort of this trade association side. Representing How many years ago was that? So my son is 28, and that was 27 years ago. Wow. Yeah, 27 years. And it's been fantastic. Right? How, how long did it take you to become the CEO? I was first CEO of the Rice Commission, wow. uh, California Rice. And I want to say it was probably five years of me rattling around in a bottom of a tin cup. And they said, you know, we probably should make you CEO. And it was a great relationship. <laughs> I was in my early 30s, uh, you know, the Sam, uh, Silicon Valley, I would have been no problem being a CEO. But I'm telling you, in agriculture, you're 30 years old and you're a CEO. That's saying Yeah, so. it's uncomfortable <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's good, though. That's good. So did that. And we just started really on a journey uh, in the Rice Commission in California Rice of really trying to to take a look at what our growers were doing on their lands, right? That was thoughtful, really respectful of the change that had happened in the generation that really started our organization of, look, we need to be good neighbors, right? First, we need to be good stewards, of course, but there's more on our land that we can do than just grow rice. Okay, we're gonna get into a lot of things that you're doing. Before you do that, I want you to just tell the listeners about how many rice growers, how much land, talk more a little bit about more about the markets, the type of rice you grow. That's all really important Thank you. Uh, for people to understand. Right. So rice in the Sacramento Valley is a big deal. We grow about a half a million acres of rice, usually considered one of the dominant crops in, in the valley. You go and that's in, from Sacramento North? Sacramento to about Chico, mm -hmm. right? If you see something that looks kind of green in the summertime or this time of year where the fields are kind of muddy, maybe a little bit of water on them, uh, certainly in the wintertime, those are all rice fields, right? If it doesn't, it's not a tree uh, and it looks like wheat or grass, that's actually rice grown in about five inches of water only on our fields and on heavy clay soils uh, that hold that water right on the surface. So the Sacramento Valley turns out is a fantastic place to grow japonica rice, 
It's a temperate variety. It doesn't grow in tropical climates, but it grows in places like Italy, Spain, a northern end of Japan, right? Korea, and also the Sacramento Valley. And what it likes is the summers that are hot, no rain, good rain fall in the wintertime so we can irrigate, but it really likes the, that temperate Mediterranean climate, right? That California is famous for. The rice that is more tropical in nature actually doesn't grow here, doesn't grow in those other places also because those are tropical varieties. Is that a long grain versus a and short grain? It is, grain? right? So those are the long grain rices mm-hmm. that were, I grew up eating, right? Mm-hmm. Fluff with a fork, mm-hmm. put gravy on it if you're from the south. And these rices are sticky, clingy. They have starch that is uh, stickier in nature. And so you're going to say, oh, I eat California rice when you eat what? Sushi. We grow almost all the sushi rice in the United States is grown right here in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, We grow rice that's in your Korean rice bowls. We grow the mochi rice. If you get either the mochi ice cream, if you're sort of, you know, not really into super into mochi, but if you're super into mochi, it's the same thing in the mochi cakes. And really known throughout the world for that really super high quality japonica medium and short grain rices that we grow here in california at the supermarket at safeway or you know wherever you might be shopping you might see a a, a variety called cal rose and it was started in the in the 60s and it means california rose our our best uh, and those varieties now are grown really by about 2500 farmers in the sacramento valley and we have about 50 different organizations that either uh, sell that rice or mill that rice into packages that would go really all around the world. So you that's know. interesting. You have a geographically focused industry, 2,500 growers. What would you say? How many businesses? About 50. About 50. So you actually, it's like, a, you know, one of the things we, we talk about is that the United States is, and almost California are too big to actually govern. But you have something that's governable. <laughs> I do. I can yeah. drive from here to Chico in two hours and see all my folks. See all the mills, see both sides of the Sacramento Valley where That's we're growing That's an advantage, rice. isn't it? It really is an advantage. It's a really tight community, too. People know each other. People change businesses, uh, you know, go work for this rice mill, and then a couple of years later, they're working for somebody else. And, you know, farming families, you tend to kind of run a little bit with the people that grow your same crops, like almond folks run with almond folks. Well, rice folks run run hard with rice folks. So it's a great community and they're all family farmers, people farming with their brother, their sister, their parents, looking to hand that farm down, right, to their children uh, if, if they're able to come back to the farm and that's of interest to them. So it's a great tight community. That was great, perfect. People understand now what we're talking about when we talk about the rice industry, what it is. What I want to do is to start talking about what you referred to earlier, this evolution to work on policy and being a good neighbor and a good steward and a part of the community in a certain sense, and how what you just described about the industry and the families, how that impacts. It seems like it would be a lot easier to get people to agree to do proactive, visionary things. As easy as it can be in agriculture. Uh, you know, some days are better than others. But yes, the, the close sense of community, the real thoughtful portion uh, of our industry, sort of like my father's generation, who said, look, you know, we, we can't burn rice straw anymore and impact our neighbors. That was what we were known for. And what year right? was that? Because I, I was in, in the podcast we did about this earlier. I was saying when I was a kid in San Jose, yeah. we used to see the smoke That's at a certain right. time of year. We knew when they were burning rice. 80s and 90s, right? We were burning all the way through there. And then because of pressure from people like the Lung Association, uh, legislative pressure, just our neighbors saying, look, we're tired of the rice straw smoke. We were also had some materials that we use in our fields to control weeds, herbicides that were also having an impact on fish in our canals. And we really realized a couple of things. One is that you had to engage the folks that, that had a strong opinion, right? Had an opinion about what you were doing on your farm. I think up to that point, sort of the mantra in ag was, well, they can do what they're going to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But really, you can't, right? In a state like California, you can't, and frankly, you shouldn't, right? They're your neighbors. Their their opinion is as important as yours as a rice farmer. So we engaged. And our leaders really helped us understand that by engaging, by listening, by changing what we do— we can address the concerns, but we can also provide some benefits that go beyond just the rice that we farm. That's what we thought, right? We thought we, we plant seeds, we you know, tend those fields all year long, we harvest that rice, 
and our big give to the people of California, people of the U.S. and the world is this great food. And that's absolutely the case. We, we grow some of the best rice in the world. But it's got to be more than that, right? What we realize by not burning rice straw is that we could flood our fields in the wintertime break down that rice straw, almost compost it, right, in the, in the fields. But also all the ducks and the geese came. They came because there were leftover rice grains. They came because there were insects. They had a place to loaf, right? Those flooded fields were a great big giant lakes and ponds. And we could really see an increase in the number of ducks and geese on the Pacific Flyway. Didn't which, millions of birds come Oh, back? millions. At the, at the time before we started reflooding rice fields, uh, the flyway was in a bit of a funk. Uh, a couple million birds is all that would come down from Alaska and Canada. When we started flooding those fields, more habitat during that critical winter period where they could come and, and get fat, get a big, nice uh, layer of fat underneath their feathers and go back up and do what? They could go ahead and breed successfully, had higher brood uh, success, and more ducks and geese came down the next year and then the next year and the next year. And so that practice of not burning and flooding not only helped recover the Pacific Flyway, but it changed how my growers think. My growers thought of, you know, look at all this great stuff that's going on in rice fields we kind of knew about, but people like Audubon, Ducks Unlimited, people like Caltrout, right, Nature Conservancy, really interested in They became what? your allies. Habitat, right, <laughs> species. What can we do to recover? Because, you know, our, my NGO partners talk a lot about the fact that, look, at we can't really recover things or even maintain on public lands because they're pretty limited, right? Lots of limited budgets associated with that also. But if we can partner, right, with private landowners, give them sort of this is what the, the species needs, work with the farmers to hear what practices they can and can't do, we can find that middle ground and work to really turn my growers from rice farmers into rice farmers and conservationists, right? And that's how they see themselves today. Our fathers showed us it could be successful. Uh, and now my new generation of growers, right? The children of, of those guys and ladies that started California Rice 28 years ago, they're coming to us saying, look, it, we've got some other interesting species like giant garter snake or greater sandhill crane or tricolored blackbird We've got duck programs. Can we do a tricolored blackbird program? What can we do for giant garter snake? And so they're really seeing their own farming operations, which is what we call a farm, right? We call it an operation. They're seeing their farms as food and all of these conservation activities. And it's becoming increasingly important from a bottom line perspective. But it's increasingly important, I think, as the state of California, the country, the world starts to deal with things like climate resiliency. We know the water thing's going to be up and down. Farmers, they know that, right? But if you're a, a giant garter snake and you're in Calusa County and it's 2022 and you had no water in rice fields, you had a worse day, right, than species that had water on the other side of the Sacramento River. And so that rice fields, those working agricultural lands, rice in our case, really specifically managed to those habitat needs for resiliency. I really think looking forward in the next 28 years, right, past my tenure here, that's what we're going to see rice farms for. We're going to value it for those benefits just as much as the sushi we eat here at McCoonies. Yeah, that's very interesting, uh, the, the transformation in thinking from the generation that innovated and then the ethic that kind of landed within the psyches of all these younger generation farmers who now are picking out projects in a certain way right. to be conservationists. That's really wonderful. It reminds me of something that Jacob Katz, who I did, who the Nigiri Project, which we talked about last year, which is a project we're going to get into more specifically here in a minute about what you've done with salmon, what you're doing with salmon. You know, the fact that landowners in California, agriculture is the place where incredible amount of land is. I'm just curious when you look around, because you are, I mean, rice is one of the most important crops in the state of California. As you said, there's 2,500 growers. You have a voice in Sacramento. You have a voice in DC. When you talk to the other commodity leaders, people that are your 
colleagues mm -hmm. who represent other commodities. Are they looking at the success you've had and seeing the opportunities that they could also leverage to build revenue streams? Because a lot of these guys that have duck clubs on their mm -hmm. farms are earning money mm -hmm. or photographers that come out, right? Right. Earning money. So do others see that, other commodities? I think they do. You know, like any community in agriculture is, you know, just a community of people that are like-minded. At first, change is scary, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we did that a generation ago. Uh, I'm seeing in many commodities, tree crops to row crops, vegetables, really this idea of how are we going to add to California's bounty beyond just the food that we grow. You've got pollinator programs in the nut tree industry, something that I, I hadn't expected and certainly I don't think would have occurred even 10 years ago, right? You're going to have all of this land that is going to you know, be farmed differently or maybe not farmed under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Right. right? This There's idea gonna... that we're not going to pump groundwater right. at the levels we have. By necessity, that means there will be acres not planted. Half a million to a million acres, yeah. potentially, right? What happens to those lands? What can we do for species there? That, that'll be a once-in-a-generation opportunity, right? Whether you're a farmer, whether you're an NGO that says, look, we'd like to focus on, on these species that need some recovery or need to be maintained. Uh, and so I think growers are starting to see that success is possible. It's not scary, right? You can make friends with, with people like Michael Dimmick, right? <laughs> and, and have a dialogue where we learn things, where we understand that we have a lot in common, right? And truly a respect, right? Our NGO partners, we have a great respect for because they're helpful. They, they care about what farmers need. Similarly, we are understanding of, look, it's tough to run a nonprofit. It's tough to be able to recover a species. It's got great science, but then how do you actualize it, right? You know, the, the species needs habitat that looks like a certain location next to a wildlife refuge or a certain amount of water at a certain time of year. But you don't control land. You don't really have budgets to be able to do it. How do you partner together to do that? There's just a tremendous amount of respect for our NGO partners. So that respect, and my commodity partners will, I've got two conversations, right? One is with the grower who goes, well, I hear that thing's going pretty good. You guys are doing a great job. Talk to my colleagues, right? The other execs, we're trying to go as fast as we can, right? Mm -hmm. Learn things from Rice, trying to continue to promote the dialogues in my boardrooms that will allow us to be able to do some things that, that we couldn't have done in the past. So I think it'll be great for, this, for the state of California. Yep. Well, there's a whole line of questions I could go into around the, the people that represent the rice industry and the cattle industry and the almond industry, the frontline lobbyists. You know, I was here today in Sacramento lobbying because we want to get this bond passed. And, you know, I, I, the cattlemen were here today. The cattlemen guys with their the cowboy hats, and they were giving out cowboy Hanging hats. Hanging out with you. No, yeah. yeah. Outstanding. So we, we, saw, we saw legislators wearing cowboy hats everywhere. It was great. But that whole world of the people that represent the big commodities of the state, I mean, they have to be affected by what you've done. They have to be thinking about how their clients – can mimic what you've done in a certain way. Yeah, right. You you want to be able to walk into of an trouble, office, right. right, and say, we you know, we care about something more than just ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And if in case of rice, you walk in, you say, well, there's the Pacific Flyway. Look at what rice does for, you know, seven to ten million ducks and geese that come every winter and are here because of the rice fields, uh, and go back in far better shape to breed than they would have otherwise. A look at what rice does for salmon, which I know we'll talk, about. talk about. What that. about yeah. you know new species, giant garter snake, tricolor blackbird, western pond turtle is a new one that we know lives in our fields but is under special status a consideration. So what can we do Protection, there? you mean, by Protection, special Protection, right. Yeah, right. And so being able to walk in and have those conversations, what makes you more relevant, right, more interesting to somebody who's outside – Bigs, California, or represents, you know, Yuba City. You can go have that conversation for folks in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can really broaden that understanding and appeal. And then similarly, right, we try to get beyond our four corners of what, what about farming? Somebody comes to us and says, look, we've got a small business, for example, that uh, we want to do a piece of legislation that allows tasting 
of soju, which is an alcohol, mm -hmm. primarily uh, Chinese and South Korean, that's made out of of grains. It's a distilled spirit. Rice is often used. I like soju a lot. Right. That's great. And so we'll be supportive of that piece of legislation. We don't have soju bars in Calusa, but there are soju bars in Los Angeles, right? In San, San Francisco. Francisco yeah. All these great places. And now we can partner, just like you were with the cattlemen, to say, hey, look, we've got some common interests. And so that really changes the dialogue in the capital in a state that, you know, it's easy to not understand what's going on outside your little community. Rice, it's easy to not understand what's going on inside your, outside your community in Los Angeles. But we have these common threads, right? We have these connections. Uh, much like Roots of Change have done. Look, there's some stuff that we could all do to make this better, and we can actually agree on it and work together. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base, which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. Let's dive into the fish now. For those who didn't hear the David Katz interview a year ago, I mean, not David Katz, that's his father, Jacob Katz, we talked about his work with your growers to create the nurseries mm. for salmon. Because what we talked about is that Sacramento River was the largest source of salmon in California. The largest runs of salmon came out of the Sacramento River. And that was lost for probably, well, it was degraded for probably 100 years before you guys, previous because of mining, all these other things that happened way back in the past, and then um, the way that we farmed rice for many years. But that changed, as you described, and there became an opportunity. So what is going on? Describe for people what the rice growers can do to create nurseries for salmon. It's really exciting. Um, there's kind of two pieces to it. There's what we can do uh, in our rice fields in the wintertime, right? Not growing rice, but you have that leftover straw like we talked about. You have uh, a way to control water in and out of a rice field. We do that all year long and certainly can do it in the winter. Uh, and the idea is in these bypasses. If you're familiar with Sacramento, you come from the Bay Area. On Highway right? You get 80. to about Davis, and all of a sudden there's like all this water, and you're not Sure, it's the river. You're not sure it's not the river. And then you get to the river, and you're like, well, what was that? Well, that was the bypass. That was the area that we've set aside to say that when the river runs really high, uh, we'll continue to primarily provide flood protection, right? And we'll shunt the water further up north around Sacramento in these by bypasses. So it's very wide and very shallow. And what happens in the rice fields in those areas uh, is that we know that if you put a little bit of water, about 10 inches, uh, you let the sun shine on it, all of that carbon from the rice straw uh, will actually start the natural processes that were once so abundant in the Sacramento Valley. Yeah, because uh, this you, was a huge floodplain. Yeah, from really foothill to foothill, right? right? You would look down. Uh, there's a, a book back in the 1870s written by a guy named William Brewer. I would suggest it to anybody. Uh, and he talks about how the Sacramento Valley was flooded from Fairfield, you know, all the way up uh, to the foothills in Folsom. Uh, because the river flooded, and it did it every year, right? Sacramento, the Feather, the Yuba, all these rivers. And so now the floodplain in the Sacramento Valley, it's really rice. It's rice in these bypass areas, but it's also rice outside the bypass areas. In the bypasses, what we know is we can take a little bit of water, maybe especially in years like this where the bypasses aren't flowing naturally, uh, which is great for salmon because they grow all that zooplankton, that sunshine, the carbon, the shallow water that's moving slow grows zooplankton, right? Little seriodaphne, remember from your biology yep. classes, right. fish love those. In fact, that's really what they need to be successful. Get big, swim back out to the ocean. They need a spot where they can do it where they're not fighting the current, right, all of the time. Rice fields can do that, especially in years where the bypasses don't flood. We can take rice fields that we make some changes to after we harvest and we can get some water on there and we can grow salmon just like they would natively have grown on the floodplain and then get them back out into the river. They can swim on their own. They swim in, eat the food, swim out. They're like four times bigger 
right? Because um, they don't have to expend energy in the river. They're right. in a shallow, calm area. So they just fatten up. It's, and it's a ton of food, right? It's like the equivalent of scrounging around in my truck looking for that one cliff bar I got left or just going through the line and in and out, right? <laughs> oh, I'm going to go two, three times a day. That's really what the difference is. A little bit of food compared to really whatever you would want. And it's the exact kind of food that they would have had historically. So that's in the bypass areas. We think about 70,000 acres we can manage specifically for salmon. Uh, outside the bypasses, so outside those big levees uh, that are really where they're not for farming. We farm there now, but that's not where they were built. They were built to protect cities like Sacramento from flooding, right? Mm -hmm. Yuba City, Marysville, all those towns. Um, outside those areas, we can flood the fields. Not going to get a salmon in there, but what you can do is grow those zooplankton, and then we just release the water up to four times, and get that zooplankton back in the river. Oh, so you're you're flushing the, right. the flat spots to put the food in the river. Right, exactly. So and they that, have a lot more to eat. A lot more. So we can do in the bypass areas, do about 70,000 acres where nurseries for fish. In those areas outside the bypasses, we think there'll be a couple of hundred thousand acres. Wow. Uh, in addition, that we could just grow that zooplankton and flush it back out to the river. So who would have known? You take a rice field. We knew what we could do for ducks and geese. We never thought before somebody like Jacob came and said, look, Sacramento Valley used to be a floodplain. We got all these rice fields hanging around out here. We've got some refuges. Can we replicate that? Maybe not at that same giant scale, but at significant scale. We're not talking 10 acres or 100 acres or 1,000 acres. We're talking 250, 350,000 acres of rice fields in the wintertime managed specifically for salmon food and for salmon rearing. It could be a game changer. We yeah, really think I mean, it, it could, could bring back, I don't know, I, I'm not a scientist, and, uh, and Jacob didn't say this, but he did say that he thinks it could be the recovery of the salmon. Really because, could be. Yeah, and salmon isn't the only thing right? There are a lot of other species that you're mentioning. I mean, why don't you, because there are mammals that live off the salmon. There are all kinds of things that are going to happen. All kinds of things. Another fish that kind of become important is the green sturgeon, right? Not maybe as kind of flashy as the salmon, but they need passage through those same bypass areas. Uh, we know that giant garter snake, it's about a three, three and a half foot, you now black and yellow striped snake, specifically live in the canals that feed the rice fields. Uh, they forage in rice fields. We've got a lot of in, invertebrates there. We've got a lot of uh, amphibians, small frogs, tadpoles, things like that, crawfish. They'll eat those. Very dependent on rice fields. We know that we have the giant or the greater sandhill crane that I talked about. We also have a really cool bird, one of my favorites, uh, that is considered threatened. Uh, and it's called a black tern. It's a smaller of the tern species, but it's a, a charcoal, dusky color. And they actually will nest right in a rice field and then feed in the canals and ditches around there. So programs that our growers can implement on their fields, we just really partner with our NGOs. In this case, it would be something like Point Blue Conservation Sciences and say, okay, what, what do shorebirds need? What do, what do black terns need? And say, well, they need nesting habitat that looks like this. When we tell our growers, hey, could we do these couple of things? Oh, sure. Well, we may need a little bit of money to do a thing, uh, but we can absolutely do that. And so rice fields are really uniquely connected in the Sacramento Valley. And in California is the, that crop that can replicate those once abundant wetlands, 95% of which are now gone, but that half a million acres of rice can really be that surrogate wetland at a time when climate change is really whipsawing not only farmers, but also all of these species. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good turn of events. Uh, it gives me tremendous hope. And the scale that you're talking about, I mean, 300,000 acres, I mean, that's, that's stupendous. There's going to be a lot of species living in, in, in that much ground. One of the things that I thought of is we were talking before we started recording about the Sites Reservoir, which is the first reservoir that is scheduled to be built in probably 40 years in this right. state, which is taking years and years. But Governor Gavin Newsom actually threw his weight behind making that the first project to be supported by this um, accelerated CEQA process, which right. is CEQA has been argued on all sides 
For many years, the enviros never wanted to change it. The growers wanted to change it. So it was a fight, a fight, a fight. But it's really interesting to me, the fact that this project has been approved by a governor who is probably perceived as more on the environmental side. Right. Um, But he has backed this. And I wonder if it's in a certain sense, because the upper Sacramento River Valley area, which is predominantly a rice source of rice, and the industry is the predominant industry in a certain way. I mean, you guys have done a good job. So it makes it easier for a political leader to do something that's going to benefit both growers and environmentalists because he's got somebody who's been doing a lot of good stuff. And it's an easy fight for him to make. Yeah, I think it is an easier case to make to the public. There's certain folks that, you know, always will want, want more water storage just because it's more water storage. Uh, there's certain folks that are, you know, kind of anti, uh, you know, taking water from anywhere it's at, put it someplace else. Let's set that aside for a second. Let's talk about the people in the middle, right, who can say, I'm interested in supporting projects, right, that kind of make sense, that don't just kind of benefit somebody specifically, and I think sites and sites in the Sacramento Valley make particularly good sense. So what's unique about sites uh, is that there's certainly water for, for some urban uses. That's the primary beneficiary. There's some rice or water for agriculture, a little bit maybe more for rice, but not a lot. But there's this big block of water, we call it the environmental water in sites, where the environment right has water behind a reservoir for fish and wildlife, Department of Water Resources, to use to the benefit of the environment. To keep the flows going keep the flows in dry going. times. Yeah. Right. Make sure that when we're doing projects, maybe maybe like the salmon rearing in the bypass, is that we, when the water's not really high in the river and, and maybe it's a little bit of a dry year, let's go ahead and flood those 70,000 acres or part of the 70,000 acres in those bypasses, get those salmon really growing big, uh, and get them back out in those drier years, that that block of water that can be managed for those projects, maybe flushing flows for salmon when the smolts are coming down uh, and the river's a little low later in the year in that May, June time frame, uh, really makes sense in the Sacramento Valley. You know, our, our NGO partners and all, all the water districts up here, you know, have been talking for a while. And I think it's really true that the Sacramento Valley is probably the, the last great place in California, maybe the best place in the world right now where we can take and restore right, some of those environmental benefits. that We can do it at scale, not just a few acres here in a you know, reserve over here, uh, but really uh, focus on bringing some of those practices back at a landscape level. Change and untwist right, some of the things that we've done in the you know, 100 years ago to keep our cities from flooding and really show Rice, Sites Reservoir, all of our irrigation partners, Caltrout, all of our NGO partners, that we can all work together toward these benefits that are kind of supra, our own individual benefits, right? Bigger than Rice. It's bigger than Caltrout, right? It's bigger than Point Blue Conservation Sites. It's even bigger than Ducks. We've got Ducks Unlimited, believe it or not, working hand-in-hand on projects that really only focus on salmon. Mm -hmm. Why? Sacramento Valley is the best place to show that we can take farming lands, rice, grow rice, we can flood them, provide great habitat for the Pacific Flyway, all the ducks and geese. But we can also grow salmon at the same time, plus provide all these other 230 species of wildlife habitat during the entire year. And really a, a system in California, thoughtful people across the state, especially at the policy side, that are willing to take the risks to try to make projects like this work, right? Invest some time, invest some money, be hopeful uh, that we can really make it better for the future generations. Well, you know, it's the, the thing that's important to me about this, really important to me about this, is that traditionally agriculture and government have been at odds, and particularly democratic governments <laughs> have been at odds. But... As I listened to the head of the California Natural Resources Agency, Wade Crowfoot, I hear him talking about agriculture. Agriculture is an ally. Yeah. Didn't used to be that way. No. 
didn't used to be that way at all. And, and that's, that's a very exciting thing because it says to me, maybe that polarization, which the, as, as, you know, the polarization in our country is so stark and horrible right now, this is like a bright spot where there doesn't have to be polarization. We've actually found the common ground to work together. And it's not about party. It's about the end results. It, really? it helps the growers. It helps the community. It makes, I mean, it, it makes it easier for the politicians to make decisions because it's not polarized. They can do something. Uh, and that's a, that's a win-win in my view right now. And, um, so I'm, I'm, I, you know, we're running out of time here. So I wanted to kind of talk about something that, um, has been on my mind, which is the state of California is about to define this term regenerative agriculture. And we've, I've had done a lot of podcasts on this topic, but so I'm just curious about how California rice feels about this. Is it worrisome or because of all the work you're doing, do you feel like it's kind of a slam dunk for your growers? Yeah, it, it really seems like something we can do, right? We now, you know, depending on how regenerative is defined based on the person you're talking to or what the state of California may do. This concept that we're, we're growing food, we're doing it in a way that uh, increases diversity of species, land use, uh, and this idea that we're doing it with lower inputs. That's what we do every day, right? And so I really think from our grower's perspective, this is, this is really going to be within our ballpark. I don't know that you're going to have a whole lot of acres sign up as regenerative rice, but I do think that if you ask 250 you know, farmers, 249 of them say, yeah, I, I do that stuff. That's me. That's what I do. Uh, so I really think that the concepts under regenerative, right, community uh, concepts of multiple species, right, we're not going to have maybe necessarily livestock on our, our rice farms, but we certainly have ducks and geese, mm-hmm. have salmon, all these other species. Well, ducks and geese are doing the same thing in same a way thing. that the cattle do on dry exactly, land. Right? Yeah. Manure, yeah. right? You know, stirring up the soil, right, right? right? Rebuilding the soils, all of those things. So for us, it's not a, a sheep or a, a cow, beef. It's it's a duck. It's a goose. It's a it's a swan, right? And so it it actually it'll feel familiar to our folks. But importantly, I think from my perspective, it also I think the the dialogue around regenerative. Uh, agriculture, this idea that we need to value, right, the the uses of those lands in a way that maybe beyond just going and, and buying a, a bag of rice or a, a cheap box of, you know, cereal, that there's really value to us as a community, to us as, as Californians, beyond just, you know, the lowest priced food that we can put on the shelf, right? It's important to who we are. It's important, you know, in Santa Cruz, we're living in willows, right? You want a good place in California where cool wildlife lives and, you know, we can use those lands beyond just farming fence row to fence row. And my farmers are all about that. They may not use the word regenerative. They're going to say, yeah, that's me. You just described me. We're rice. So we may not say we're regenerative, but we're going to say we're rice. Look at all the cool stuff that lines up with with those same values. So it's interesting to me because what you got into there is the corollary benefits. I mean, the system in the United States now, and um, it just made me think about how we have created kind of insurance for farmers in low price times through subsidy systems or insurance for crop uh, crop insurance subsidies or, um, you know, do you see, I mean, which is a, a thing that many people attack in this country, right? That we're subsidizing farmers. I've always believed that we need to because you need to keep food prices at a certain level and you got to balance out the the natural ebb and flow, the ups and downs of a marketplace. And it's very hard to do keep a business alive. Very hard. I mean, cattle right now, it's prices are great, but a few years ago, prices were terrible. And right. so it's really hard to handle this. So, so there needs to be ways to regulate the variability of markets in order to make it viable to run a business that's already unpredictable because of weather and all the other things that are going on. International trade. International trade, yeah. Can't ship rice to the yeah, Middle or East. Or a commodity, right? I mean, a, 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 a COVID that shut Absolutely. down all the shipping. I mean, it's just crazy, right? So do you see a time where we could change the subsidy system to pay farmers for these ecosystem services, which everybody can say yes to, rather than say for insurance or other things? 
I know sure. I'm putting you on a limb here, but... No, I understand. That's a great question. People ask me, too. They don't really understand why we would support farmers uh, when prices are low. And I think you've hit it, right? Re- crop insurance is an item for us that we really focus on. And frankly, when prices are really, really low or you can't farm because of too much rain or, or too little rain like we had in 2022, it's simple. It keeps you in business. You can farm the next year. You know, we've got family farms, right, that have expenditures of millions of dollars in expenses, right? And if something goes wrong, there's no safety net outside of, of crop insurance, Crop insurance, right? I think you need that. Uh, what we're starting to see is beyond sort of those base levels, we are seeing an increase in incentives, right? Programs for farmers to say, look, there's some conservation practices uh, that we're interested, endpoints, right? We want to preserve the Pacific Flyway. Uh, We want to enhance salmon habitat, maybe in the case of rice. Where can we allocate some dollars, right? Maybe some reallocated dollars, maybe some new dollars. Public dollars, right? Climate Smart Commodity Program, which is kind of popular now, came out of additional spending, right? And farmers have accepted that. They've said, look, yeah, we can do some practices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on agriculture. We're willing to participate in that because it's an incentive program and they can do those. For rice, for us, it's really focused on the species benefit, right? That habitat that we can provide on those same fields. So we're focused there. But yes, I think in the future, that recognition that farms can do more than just produce food, that's also going to take some some public participation to get that done. It goes back to your comment before. It's a win-win, right? Farmers are able to offset some of those costs. We're able to get greenhouse gas reductions in the case of you know things like cover crops and some of those other things. In the case of rice, maybe not so much greenhouse gas reductions, but really focus on that winter flooded habitat like we've species. been talking about. Species, species. diversity. Yeah, yeah, and growers are ready for those kinds of conversations. Good. So... We're getting to the end, so there, there are a couple of things I want to bring up for you to kind of closing comments. One was the evolution in who you're hiring. I thought that was very interesting from where you started to who you're hiring now because of the complexity required, the science required. The, the, that's very interesting to me. If you just describe some of the people you hire now. And then I think it would be really cool for you just to set up the study you're about to launch mm-hmm. that is kind of a very holistic study of your industry and what you think that might lead to, because when that study's done, I want to do another podcast. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. So we're hiring different people, I'd say 27 years now. We started, we hired generalists, right? People that were willing to work for what you were paying, come to work and work really hard and do great stuff. We're focused on common agriculture issues. Today, we're not focused on common agricultural issues. I'm interested in shorebird utilization of, of rice lands that have been designated as habitat of international significance, right? Right here in the Sacramento Valley. So we hire a shorebird biologist from Point Blue Conservation Sciences to manage that program, help us with science. We're actually doing science with our NGOs, little backpacks on things like long-billed curlews. Where, where do they go? We know they're in rice, but where else do they go? And when do they go there? Science has never been done before. Uh, we're hiring hydrogeologists to help us understand water quality and water use uh, in rice. Uh, we're hiring people who used to produce news, right? Because we're doing more things like podcasts, right? You're doing more things like digital advertising. And so I think the days of generalists are going away uh, because the the demands, but also the opportunities the things that we'll be doing in the next 27 years are going to require people that are super smart, right? That really understand Deep science, knowledge. right? And, and can go out there and, and have master's degrees and programs to get that done. So very much an evolution from where, where I started. But Barry, I think telling on where agriculture is going and I think the opportunities that are ahead. That's great. So let's go into the study that you're doing with UC Davis. It's very interesting. Or A&R. I don't know if it's UC Davis or A&R. Yeah, it's UC Davis because it cuts across uh, A&R and other disciplines as well. Uh, really the first of its kind for UC Davis to look at the ecosystems services and community services that are provided by working agricultural lands. In our case, this will be a rice study. Uh, and we've really asked ourselves the question coming out of the highs and the lows, drought, flood, uh, habitat that is so, you know, so important for like salmon, 
how many how many acres of rice really do we need on the landscape to be able to provide the habitat that we need now plus what we want to grow it to be uh, plus our small communities I always tell people you go outside Sacramento San Francisco Los Angeles all of the Central Valley are small little towns that you would see anywhere in the Midwest it's got the grain elevator it's got the little diner it's got the hardware store the the tractor supply store those are as rural communities as you can get anywhere in the country and they're here in California a state of 40 million people they rely on agriculture. There is no other business uh, in Calusa County, in the town of Williams, than farming. Almonds, rice, walnuts. Olives. But it's farming. Yeah, it's olives. It's, it's all farming. So also look at the small communities. They're so dependent, right? Rural, often very impoverished, right? Very high levels of unemployment. Uh, and so this study called the Rice Footprint uh, will really look at that first understanding, multidiscipline, waterfowl, right? We're looking at uh, reptiles, giant garter snake, others. Looking at salmon, we're looking at agronomics. Is it rice? Is it trees, right? And we're also looking at the community impacts of if we as a state were to ask ourselves, hey, we really think rice is important, and we do, how many acres do we need in the, in the Sacramento Valley, also in the San Joaquin Valley, our next phase in about 10 years is going to be where exactly should those acres be for which species uh, and close to what things like wildlife refuges, et cetera, and really dial that into we need a program of 30,000 acres for giant garter snake within 10 miles of the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge, for example, and wow. really be able to dial that in. That's a way different discussion yes. than how much rice should we grow and should we send it yeah. to Japan or South Korea. Yeah, it's it turns it it turns it all around. It really it actually is the realization of this idea of the working lands, the working lands, the multiple benefits that agriculture can provide that Karen Ross and you and others have been saying for years we can do these things. It's it's actually it's going to make it real clear in scientific terms. And that could be transformative for the whole world, really. I think so. Uh, you know, the, the benefit of being in a place like California is that the competition, right, water, land, uh, habitat is so intense. And we have this great agricultural place also, right? Unlike really any place else in the world, do we grow the diversity of crops, things like rice, and at the same time you're talking about growing things like pistachios. How can we do it here at scale, right, and, and really change systems in a way so when folks come to UC Davis, send their kids to UC Davis, they're studying not only about rice, but rice and conservation, right, rice and very specific habitat And economic benefits. development. Right, economic yeah. development, small towns mm -hmm. throughout our valley. Uh, why is that important? Because you know what? Those are common problems around the world, whether you're farming in Africa, whether you're farming in India, Australia, we all have the same problems that Benefits of being in a place like California, the thoughtful, right? People that care about their community, farmers that care about the state of California, rice farmers care about San Diego, really be able to sit down and say, well, what are the common solutions that we need to pursue so that we can be successful no matter where you're at in California? Wow. Great place to end. Tim Johnson, thank you very much. Another great conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited about your studies and the next 27 years of California rice. As you know, I am a big fan. I think you guys uh, set the pace for all the other crops in the state. And I encourage all other crops to look at what you guys have done because it's a, it's a shiny example and inspiring. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for listening. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute. 